Let's examples. You are going to hear a conversation between an agent and a client. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Are you open yet? Yes, we are. Come in. Would you like to rent an apartment in the city? Well, kind of. I'd rather rent one near the harbor if possible. Oh, okay. Do you like the water? Yes, I do. But I actually repair sailboats for a living. So I'd like to be close to work. That's understandable. We all want to live close to work. Well, I think I have something near there. How many rooms would you like? Just one. I'm alone. But I would like to have an extra room for my dog. So you'd like two rooms and an apartment that accepts animals. Hmm. Here's one. It's one block up from the harbor and renting for $445. How's that? That's perfect. Just what I was hoping to pay. What floor is it on? Floor? Oh, it's on the twelfth floor. That's too high. I'd like to be on the first or second floor so that I don't have to use the elevator. My dog, he's scared of them. Oh, well then, that's a little more complicated. Let me make a few calls. Okay, I think I found a couple more for you. Here's one that might suit your needs. How much? $395 a month. That's cheap. But it's only a one-bedroom, a large one, but it's still just one room. Oh. Well, regardless of whether the room is small, I still need a separate room for my dog. What else do you have? Then I have a two-bedroom for $565 on the second floor that is a little further away from the harbor. How far? About a half mile, and they accept pets. That's a little more than I had planned on paying. But I guess I could look at it. What's the address? 224 Williams Avenue, Harbor Square. 224 Williams Avenue. Got it. Now look at questions 7 to 10. As the talk continues, answer questions 7 to 10. What else is included? Let's see. It has a washer and dryer, refrigerator and stove, a bed, dressers and shelves, and access to a swimming pool, game room, and gym. Ooh, I'll definitely take a look. Hi, how did you like it? It's great. I love the amenities, but the bed and furniture are awfully dirty. Can they replace those before I move in? Sure, that shouldn't be a problem. Anything else? Yeah. I didn't see anywhere to park my car. Is there a parking lot in the basement? Yes, there is. Would you like to rent a space? No, I'd like that to be included in the rent. Oh, well, I'll see what I can do, but I can't guarantee that. Do you want to take it anyhow? If those two issues were solved, I would love to take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. I'm here today with Helen Warner, who has been a vegetarian for many years and is going to talk a little about vegetarianism. Helen, the concept of vegetarianism seems to have interested a number of our listeners, who have sent in some questions. To begin, what made you want to become a vegetarian? Well, when I was 16, I had friends who were vegetarian and they introduced me to the idea. My parents were typical of their generation and ate meat at least three or four times a week, so I didn't really think about it too much until a few years later. It was while I was at university that I really thought about it and decided that it was unfair to eat meat when there are so many alternatives available. Is there anything you miss about not eating meat? Um, no, not really. As I said, there are so many substitutes available these days, perhaps the most important of which comes from the soya bean. Soya is so versatile and is the staple substitute for most vegetarians. So what about the nutritional value of vegetarian food? Isn't it true that there are some vitamins that you can't get from soya or vegetables alone? Surely people need these vitamins. Yes, that's correct. But actually there is only one vital vitamin that is only present in meat. That's vitamin B12. Most vegetarians are aware of the implication of this and actually take B12 supplement in the form of tablets. Of course, the way you cook vegetables is also very important in preserving vitamins. Many countries, particularly the UK, have a reputation for overcooking vegetables. Water-soluble vitamins, you know, where the vitamins are dissolved into the water, are often lost. Vitamin C is a common example. However, the loss of vitamins can be avoided by microwaving or steaming vegetables, which is what I do whenever I cook. Some people don't want to change their cooking habits too much, so if you do boil them, simply cut down on the cooking time. So a vegetarian diet is fairly healthy then? Oh yes. A lot of people believe that vegetarianism is unhealthy, but that's actually not the case. Vegetarians are actually considerably healthier than many meat eaters. Consider for a minute the health aspects of the incredible amount of meat this country and others like it consume. The statistics for beef eating, for example, are quite frightening. The world figure for beef consumption is slightly less than 11 kilograms per person each year. Yet in Europe, the average consumption is nearly double that at 21 kilos per person. And in the USA, it is even worse, with the average person eating 44 kilograms of beef every year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So are you suggesting that people stop eating meat altogether and everyone adopts a vegetarian lifestyle? No, not at all. Even in the healthiest diets, there is still a place for meat, but it should be eaten in moderation. Many nutritionists think of foods in terms of a pyramid, with the foods we can eat relatively freely at the bottom and the foods we should carefully restrict at the top. The majority of our diet should be composed of cereals, which would go on the bottom row of the pyramid. In this category could also be included such things as rice and pasta. Next, a good diet is followed by a roughly equal amount of vegetables and fruit. I have at least two servings a day of fruit and vegetables whenever possible. In decreasing quantities, you can then eat dairy foods, eggs, cheese, etc. Almost at the top of the food pyramid comes fish, carefully prepared of course, not dripping in oil or batter, and white meat. Chicken, for example, is 
a comparatively healthy meat, but again, a lot of this comes down to preparation methods. Right at the top of the pyramid come the ingredients of far too many Western meals, red meat and potatoes. It is particularly in that area that I would suggest moderation. Well, thank you very much, Helen. I'm sure that a lot of listeners are interested in your views. How could they find out more about the health benefits of vegetarian options? Well, there are lots of websites and books on healthy eating and vegetarianism, but it is always important to remember to consult your doctor before making any radical changes to your diet or lifestyle. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between two work colleagues and their manager about the restructuring of their company. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in, both of you. I believe you wanted to talk to me about something, is that right? Yes. Basically, all the staff are concerned about what the restructuring of the company is going to mean for them. None more so than myself and Nam, as we are the newest members. Oh, as I said to all staff at the meeting last week, there's no cause for concern. There will be no compulsory redundancies. All redundancies will be on a voluntary basis. Yes, we, we understand that, but to tell the truth, we just want a little reassurance that our jobs are safe. Look, Anne and Penny, the company isn't going to be short-sighted and let its bright young minds go. Besides, we've already met our target for the number of voluntary redundancies we want to secure. In fact, there's a waiting list. You know as well as I do that the age profile of staff at this company needs to come down. A lot of our employees are close to retirement age and are just going through the motions until they can take their pensions. That's why we decided on this redundancy initiative. We want to encourage those that would be happy to leave to do so and employ younger, more motivated staff. I guess that makes us feel a little better. But we're also worried about the upcoming salary review. What would it mean for us? Given the fact that the company's motivation for this restructuring initiative is not to cut costs, one again, you needn't be worried that there will be a negative effect on your salaries. We are running a very profitable business and we will reward our top performers in the upcoming review. Both of you fall into that category so you can expect a healthy bonus and salary increase. Simple as that. That's good to know. Another thing on our minds was the fact that with all these voluntary redundancies happening in the next few months, there will be a lot of positions opening up higher in the company. What we were wondering is, will the recruitment drive be an internal or an external one? Obviously, we will recruit internally where possible. That has always been company policy. So, if you're asking me will there be opportunities to gain a promotion in the near future, then the answer is very definitely yes. The type of candidate we would be looking for has a proven track record and is performance driven. How can we improve our chances of getting promoted then when the opportunity arises? Well, in the meantime, be prepared to take on additional responsibilities. 
especially those relating to the management of other members of staff. Obviously, the higher up you go in the company, the more involved you'll be in managing people. What the management team is looking for then is proof that you can work effectively with and manage other members of staff. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. One more thing. Go on. This project you've given us to manage, is it a test of our abilities? I guess you could say it is a test of sorts, but look at it more as a chance for you to prove yourselves. Actually, now that I have you both here in private, can we talk about that a bit? Of course. OK. Penny. Let's start with you. Has the timescale been agreed yet? Yes. You said we have a total of eight weeks to bring the product to launch. So we've decided to allocate three weeks at the beginning to product research and prototype testing. Very good. Then after that, we are going to spend a further three weeks formulating our marketing strategy and doing some research and testing on a sample of the target market itself to get some feedback. And presumably the last two weeks will be devoted to the launch? Exactly. Now, let's talk estimated costs. Well, you've given us a total budget of £100,000. Of that, we're allocating 50% to product development and testing a further 25% to marketing, and £25,000 will be spent on the launch. Penny, give me a breakdown of the launch costs, would you? Sure. £10,000 will be spent on hiring and decorating the venue, £10,000 will be spent on promotional work, and the remaining money will be used to pay for catering and administrative costs. Uh, I'm very happy with that, to be honest. As I said... You guys should stop worrying. You're doing a fantastic job, so keep it up. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Nine. Listen to the second part of our lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. River dance is not just an expression of self-confidence, a kind of culturally interesting pop song. It tells the story of a people through song and dance. It tells the story of the people whose spirit was broken by an event which occurred in the middle of the last century, but continued to affect the society until 1961, the Great Famine. What is a famine? In 1840, 
the official population of Ireland was eight million. They were largely poor and living in the countryside. They were beginning to have an interest in independence, and perhaps had things been different, Ireland might have been independent much earlier. But there was a serious problem in the agricultural system. All crops were grown to pay the rent of the land, and all that was grown to eat was the potato. This was fine until the potato crop failed, as it did from 1845 to 1848. The stories of what happened in those times live on in the popular culture of Ireland, and I won't tell them here. But the result was that two million people died or left the country by 1851. When you realise that the population continued to go down until 1961, you can realise what a disastrous effect this famine had on the people. Compared with China, imagine if the famine of 1960 reduced the population by a quarter. And it kept falling to less than half of its pre-famine figure. Anybody with ideas left and went to England, America, or Australia. The people left behind were broken by their experiences, and, in effect, the famine and its consequences put an end to all serious development in the country until well into this century. The Irish in Ireland lost all hope and self-confidence, and much of our modern culture is about the sadness of that time. And the sorrow of saying goodbye to those who left and left well into this century. Ireland has the highest emigration rate of any country in Europe for the last two centuries. We even have an expression for this saying goodbye. It is called the American Wake. It means the ceremony, like that of a funeral for someone going to America, because you will never see him or her again. Do you know why there is Irish music on the film Titanic? It is because most of the people killed were Irish. The leaving continued until the 1970s, because independence in 1921 was followed by a civil war and an economic depression. Almost every family in Ireland has relatives abroad, and up to the 60s in some places, of a class of 30 graduating from high school, all left. Along the west coast, closed-up houses from that time falling into ruin are still common. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.